My name is Sanjay Gupta. I'm a cardiologist in York. Now, today uh, we have a, a really interesting program. Um, you know, several years ago, I did a set of videos. That's my the first time I got started on YouTube. And I one of my videos was on the subject of heart palpitations and ectopics. Uh, and when I did them, I had no idea that um, people would even be interested in what I had to say. But with this particular topic, the topic of heart palpitations, ectopics, uh, I had a ton of people uh, get in touch with me, a ton of feedback. And people said, look, you know, uh, I have this. I've been struggling for so many years. I've had this. I've had this. And all the patients that I uh, heard from um, mentioned that not only did they have ectopics or palpitations, they would go, they would get checked out, they would be told that there's nothing to worry about, but the symptoms would continue. And two things became very obvious to me. The first was that these were a very common problem and represented an unmet need. And the second thing was I also, uh, in my own mind, thought that, oh, if I could work out why these happened, and if I could work out a treatment, then I'd become a very rich man. So I started listening very carefully to all these patients to try and work out what connected them. You know, um, I spoke to people who were politicians. I spoke to people who were boxers. I spoke to old people, young people, all of whom were very troubled by these palpitations, both because of the discomfort but more than that, the uncertainty that they brought along with them. And uh, the one association that I've universally found is that I would say 99.9% .9 of patients I've spoken to will also admit to having a degree of um, health anxiety. And as a cardiologist, I realized that actually, if this was an association, then perhaps we should be addressing the health anxiety as well. And uh, for a long time, I struggled to do that because I didn't have uh, any contacts who had the expertise. And then uh, one day out of the blue, uh, I got an email from Matthew Biedman, who's joining me today. Matthew um, is a psychologist, and he contacted me and said, look, I have a very specific interest in heart health anxiety, cardiophobia, cardiac anxiety. And I said, wow, that's amazing, you know, and we spoke and suddenly I realized that this was the missing bit of the puzzle. Uh, and over the course of the last two or three years, we've worked closely together. I've seen many patients with uh, cardiac symptoms where you've not really found a structural problem. And we've um, referred, uh, we've worked together, uh, we've collaborated, me and Matthew, over these patients, and uh, the patients have benefited. So uh, for a long time, I've been wanting to do a talk with, you know, to have a conversation with Matthew to get uh, Matthew's insight and share that insight with the wider public. So, Matthew, I am delighted. I can't tell you how delighted I am that you've agreed to join us. Uh, welcome. Um, and please, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, thank you, Sanjay, for that introduction. Thank you for the invitation to, uh, to meet today. Um, so yeah, my, my name's Matthew. I work as a clinical psychologist. Um, I, I suppose I've always worked in physical health teams rather than mental health teams. One of my um, areas of specialism, I suppose, is applying psychological science, psychological theory to addressing barriers to people getting the best possible rehab and recovery outcomes after a period of, of illness or, or injury. Um, and, and more specifically, I've worked in a, a number of cardiac teams in the in the past. Um, worked with uh, a, you know, a range of cardiologists, and and through this work, just met so many people experiencing very similar difficulties with cardiac anxiety. Um, yeah, but my understanding of the the, the sort of the studies that look at prevalence rates are uh, is that about thirty percent of all patients who are seen by cardiologists are experiencing uh, clinically significant difficulties with cardiac anxiety. Uh, yeah, it can be a really very common, but very debilitating um, set of symptoms. Uh, the other thing that the literature is really clear about is that access to specialist, high quality psychological treatment programs is incredibly limited. 
um, very, very few people get, uh, gain access to, to treatment programs to address cardiac anxiety. And that's a big problem because we have some really effective treatment approaches. Um, I'll say a bit more later, perhaps about how CBT can be applied cognitive behavioral therapy. But we have these very effective psychological treatment approaches, but the problem is access, getting them to people. Um, so it's an area that I became really interested in because it's it's such a such a common problem, such a, a problem that um, is is so similarly experienced by many many people you know, up and down the country internationally, and the challenge is to get psychological treatment programs out there, you know, almost into the water supply so that people can get back to living their best lives. There's two things I'd like to say. Number one, I think even that 30% may just be an, you know, maybe an underestimate, you know, if we really go looking for it, yeah. uh, because a lot of, a lot of psychological symptoms manifest as physical symptoms as well. And therefore, uh, you know, unless you specifically go and look for it, uh, it may be even more than that. That's uh, one thing. And then the second thing, of course, is that there's a real problem, isn't there, that we've become so super specialized that we don't see the person as a whole. We see them as a, uh, a com uh, as a uh, collection of different organ systems and we're just interested in one organ so even in cardiology people don't even see the heart as a whole they'll say oh I'm just an electrical person I don't know anything about this and I don't know let alone thinking of the person as a more complex uh, uh, being who has you know there, there's mental health there's physical health there's uh, spiritual health no one puts it all together and really that I think is the thing that is missing you know we need to be working together for the benefit of the patient not fobbing the patient off onto each other because yeah. we don't want to deal with it or we're too worried about dealing with it or we're too defensive we need to be collaborating and that is where true innovation will come in that was where you start getting people better i i truly believe that it is impossible to be physically healthy if you're mentally unhealthy and vice versa. And therefore, uh, I think all care should involve, you know, collaboration between different professionals. So um, yeah. can you tell me a little bit about what is cardiac anxiety? What do you, how do I, uh, what is cardiac anxiety? Mm, sure. Yeah, I will. But first, I'll just echo the point you made about collaboration and how psychological treatment programs, from my perspective, can't, you know, shouldn't be delivered in isolation. Um, you know, it, it just can't work that way. We need psychologists working alongside cardiologists, but, you know, embedded services working closely if we're going to achieve the best outcomes. Because after all, you know, the, throughout history, the arts, literature, it's all emphasized a link between cardiac health and psychological health. We've, you know, I think Shakespeare spoke first spoke about being broken hearted, um, you know, when a, perhaps a relationship comes to an end or when we go through periods of psychological suffering. So this emphasis or so this link between cardiac and psychological health has been emphasized throughout history. Um, and it, it's striking to me that it, it doesn't always get acknowledged now. Um, but sorry, yes, to come back to card, what is cardiac anxiety? Um, well, as, as we've said already, first of all, it's a, a very, very common experience indeed. It can um, be a, a, an experience that people sometimes ha have after a period of cardiac ill health. So perhaps someone's been diagnosed with um, coronary heart disease or is recovering from a period of acute illness. But also sometimes people um are essentially well but experience unwanted distressing symptoms that are associated with their hearts so i'm thinking ectopics palpitations um perhaps arrhythmias cardiac symptoms associated with long covid or, or pots perhaps so there's often some some sort of trigger even chest Pardon. Even chest pain can be a even chest pain can be a manifestation, can't it, of anxiety? Yes, absolutely. That's a really, really good example. Um, so, so cardiac anxiety often arises from a, a set of uh, from a from a trigger, and 
then I suppose the way that I think about it is that it has four elements to it. Um, emotions, thoughts, certain behaviours and, and physical sensations. So first of all, it, in, in terms of the emotional sort of symptoms associated with, with cardiac anxiety, people often experience very high levels of, of fear or, or anxiety um, about their cardiac health. People might feel very frightened when their heart rate increases or they experience chest pain, chest discomfort. People might notice themselves feeling unusually nervous, um, on edge, uh, or, or have trouble relaxing. And then cardiac anxiety is also associated with certain thoughts or beliefs. Um, so for, for example, if, if some cardiac test results have come out normal, people often find that they still tend to worry about their cardiac health. Um, if they've received the all clear from a cardiologist or a doctor, they, they sometimes still worry that something's been missed or that the doctor that they saw didn't really sort of fully believe that their symptoms were real. Uh, people might notice themselves paying very close attention to their heartbeat and being unable to concentrate when their heart, heart rate has increased. Uh, they, they might worry that the doctors have missed some, something. Um, they might only feel safe when they're around a particular hospital or, or medical facility. And then another element of cardiac anxiety are the sorts of behavioural responses that we see. Um, people might start to avoid a range of either external environments, places, being in busier locations, more isolated, rural locations perhaps, uh, but also might start to avoid internal experiences, physical sensations, sweating, raised heart rate, breathlessness. Um, people might, as I've said, avoid being too far away from a trusted medical facility or a hospital. They might notice themselves frequently checking their pulse rate or their blood pressure. Um, they might notice themselves you know, frequently being checked out by a doctor or frequently speaking to their friends or families about their symptoms or placing paying very close attention to their, their heart rate um, or really being able to feel their heart beating in their chest. Uh, so essentially, it's a very, very common problem. Um, and cardiac anxiety, I think, results from the way that uh, emotions, physical sensations, uh, the way that one is interpreting cardiac sensations and, and behavioural responses are, are all interacting with each other. So uh, that's very helpful. My question, I suppose, is how does one determine that this is cardiac anxiety and not something uh, more sinister? Um, because obviously, presumably, this is a diagnosis that is made after the patient has undergone rigorous cardiac evaluation and you have excluded anything structural because you can't be absolutely sure can you particularly if it started recently i mean if someone says i've had it for 30 years that by itself reassures me as a cardiologist that if it's not done anything bad to them in 30 years then it's highly unlikely that there is something horrible going on but but before people start going into looking into cardiac anxiety as the cause of their troublesome symptoms should they all undergo cardiac evaluation first is this a diagnosis that is made after excluding everything else yes absolutely yeah i would say the um the patients that i that i work with have all been reviewed by a, a cardiologist had their symptoms investigated and the message that they've often been given is that their symptoms are essentially safe, um, benign, but often very distressing. And they've been um, encouraged to find a way of living with their symptoms. Um, so that's where that's where psychological treatment approaches can, can come in, I think. I would say if anyone has missing information about the meaning of their symptoms or, or some unanswered questions, that can be a real barrier to being able to make best use of psychological treatment programs. We need to get those questions answered, yeah, before people can come in. Interestingly, a question just popped into my head. 
what proportion of the patients you see with cardiac anxiety have only been evaluated by one doctor? Uh, or is it a case that by far and away, most of your patients have been evaluated several times by cardiologists and then they come to you? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, far and away, um, people have, have, have seen multiple cardiologists. Multiple, and been given the same information about reassurance with regards to the fact that there's nothing dangerous going on and still the symptoms persist. And often then these patients presumably just feel like, oh, I'm being made to feel by the cardiologist that I'm wasting their time now, you know, so I have nowhere else to go. And this is why, do you know, do they come, often it's because of, a lack of because they feel that there's a lack of interest or empathy after a certain point from sort of cardio cardiologists etc that they then eventually end up saying okay perhaps you could give me a different angle at sorting this out well yeah i mean i think i suppose that's how patients might experience their you know their their, their health care to date I, I would say that, that though that the, the the majority of people have experienced very very good care indeed from their their cardiologists um and they've that the patients themselves have noticed that despite that reassurance despite the information giving it's not helped uh, yeah. people have been left with nagging doubts or or what ifs or worries about whether something has been missed and unfortunately what we know is that seeking further reassurance about about that is only ever a short-term fix. Um, one of the core features of cardiac anxiety is that people doubt the information that they've been given or have trouble accepting it. That leads often to multiple investigations from different cardiologists before eventually people find their way to, to working with a, a psychologist in this area. Do you find that um... Uh, some people are reluctant to go and see a psychologist because there's some kind of uh, stigma that uh, associated with the fact that, oh, now, you know, I may have a mental health issue. And uh, do you find that? Is that something that is a, a barrier somewhere, that kind of concept that uh, to be told that you may have a mental um, processing uh, issue, which... Uh, and people don't want to accept that, you know, is it easier to accept that you have something physically wrong with you rather than whether it could be something else? Yeah, I, I think that is still a barrier. It's improving, I think, um, that the stigma that you describe around psychological health is is certainly improving, thankfully. Um, I, I think sometimes when people are referred by their cardiologist to see a psychologist, the the implicit message is is somehow well you know do they do they think that these symptoms are somehow all in my head and you know of course absolutely not that's that's you know not what what is being said here but you know i think there's a, a, a real understanding that these symptoms are absolutely real uh but that sometimes psychological and physical variables can interact with each other and and psychological treatment programs um can can provide a very very effective way forwards um i guess the way that i'm that it, it's also a very easy myth to to bust when we meet people um that no this is not about um you know mental illness this is not um we're not suggesting that these symptoms are somehow purely psychological in nature uh but here's how they're understood and therefore, here's a credible rationale for how we go about addressing them. Um, so then people can make an informed decision about what they want to do next. Uh, what, uh, another question, again, uh, that has just popped into my head is, um, do you think cardiac anxiety or health anxiety is on the rise? Uh, one, is it on the rise or is it just that it's the same, but we're recognizing more of it? And two, if it is on the rise, is that because uh, there is more trauma? Uh, is that because in society these days than before, you know, um, uh, is that because there is this huge focus, for example, on uh, people, on society telling us just to get on and 
get on with it, get on with it, you know, come on, stop, get on with it. So I found personally that, you know, you could lose a loved one. Uh, you know, I lost my father three years ago, hugely traumatic, but you'd get one week off work and then you're back in it. And perhaps somewhere because that I've never really been allowed enough time to uh, deal with that properly, perhaps that stays in me somewhere and then manifests with all these symptoms later on in life. Do you think that's, do you think that's a credible hypothesis or do you think that that's not uh, the case? I mean, I, I'm just genuinely interested. Mm. I, I I don't know what the literature would say about the, the prevalence of, of cardiac anxiety being being static or otherwise at the moment. Certainly, I agree with you um, around the point that you're making that, that you know, certain aspects around the, uh, regarding the way that we live our lives and all uh, the sorts of societal norms are not necessarily conducive to good psychological and physical health at the moment. There are other recent events as well that might be expected to um, add to the, the the number of people experiencing symptoms associated with ang with cardiac anxiety, uh, long COVID, for example, um, and and certainly a greater awareness of of cardiac anxiety and a, you know thankfully a, a stronger tendency in people to to acknowledge it, to understand it, to seek help for it would be would be adding to the prevalent rate, rates and the extent to which we see this. Um, but I, I suspect it's always, you know, been there as a, a very common uh, symptom, very common problem, one that we're just becoming more aware of at the moment. But the one thing which is interesting, isn't it, is that um, anxiety, I think, is about fear and uh, fear inherently to clever people is uh, uh, is very profitable and uh, very monetizable. So, uh, you know, if you go online and I think that that I think it's it's fear that makes the headlines, doesn't it? So uh, particularly now with the Internet, with Google, with social media, etc., people are bombarded with these horror stories. No one wants to talk about uh that ordinary person who just goes home and has a good life and it's all boring and dull they want to talk about that young guy who dropped down dead or that young guy who went 10 times to their doctor and suddenly was found dead etc so when all this is highlighted uh, and you are being exposed to it on your phones and uh, through forums and social media etc then that potentially could be another mechanism by which people start getting more and more fearful and they start to develop a distrust uh, in what they're told, because they've heard all these other stories, which may be outliers, but they've been told these stories, and they, you know, there is all that as well, which contributes, don't you think? Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, so I think there's a number of interesting things that happen there. Certainly, as, you, as you're saying, we, these days, we have much more exposure to media stories, perhaps around cardiac illness, cardiac ill health, that, that, function as triggers for people um so for example when a high profile footballer suffers a cardiac arrest on on a on a football pitch and um, that's all over the news and, and can be a very distressing trigger for people who are, are experiencing cardiac anxiety but then then two things happen i think um first of all first of all if one is experiencing cardiac anxiety we tend to have an attentional bias for items in the news that are personally significant or, or salient to us. So, you know, the example I usually give is um, when my, my, my wife was pregnant, um, suddenly in our local village, I kept noticing all these um, other pregnant mums to be. And I, I don't think it was suddenly that there was a huge increase in the number of um, of, of mums to be in the village it was just that I was much better at noticing so we all have attentional biases for things that are personally salient to us and so if news stories around cardiac illness or ectopics um, are, 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 are available our attention will be drawn to them um, the second thing is that when we feel anxious we seek reassurance and one of the the ways that we sometimes seek reassurance is by googling um, or seeking out health related information um, and and then worries start to chain together and we start to be transported mentally from, you know, the here and now to a, 
a really quite improbable but very frightening hypothetical scenario in the future. But there's a there's a, something very interesting which has changed, uh, which is really interesting because there's that attentional bias that you report that you mentioned, which I completely agree with. Uh, which is that you know you, something is happening to you, you start seeing it more often. But what is very interesting is that the internet algorithms, social media algorithms, now show you more as well. So mm -hmm. not only do you notice more. But you are presented with a lot more as well, because social media and the way these things work is, for example, if I would be looking up a special kind of briefcase that I want to buy, uh, then you will start to seeing that appear on your social media as ads, etc. So the algorithms on the Internet, not only they actually exaggerate that problem because they start showing you more stories if you're interested in um, uh, the presidential elections in the USA, you will start seeing more and more stories uh, on your social media profile. So that's very interesting, isn't it? That that heightens the problem if you're worried about if you're interested, if you start showing an interest in sudden death in footballers, then before you know it, all your social media will start bombarding you with these stories, even though you try your hardest to put it to the side. And that is a real problem, I think. Absolutely. Yeah, so feeding into this vicious cycle that yeah, we've yeah, exactly. trapped in and not only our own attentional biases, but these biases that are built into the technology that we use, you know, every hour of the day. Absolutely, which is really interesting, isn't it? And um, certainly, uh, I think some people are now getting interested in the ethics of that, you know, is that really the right thing where you're actually uh, almost brainwashing a population? Um, so... Uh, We've talked about cardiac anxiety. We've talked about how common it is. We've talked about why we think it's getting, why it's so common. Uh, you've told me a little bit about the symptoms. Um, are there some people who come to you and they and you think to yourself, no, this is not cardiac anxiety? Hmm. How do you decide that? That's a good good question. Yeah. So um. So I mean, in terms of how we would decide or diagnose cardiac anxiety there are there are validated measures questionnaires that have been developed um so they ask about the sorts of symptoms that that i was describing earlier but you're you yeah you know, absolutely right that sometimes after a period of cardiac ill health or a period of experiencing persistent or distressing cardiac symptoms there can be other difficulties that people might experience that that aren't cardiac anxiety and require a separate treatment approach uh, so for example if somebody has been exposed to a uh, an intensely frightening or horrifying event and over the last month or so have noticed that they're experiencing memories that come back to them during the day against their will uh, so intrusive memories, flashbacks, or perhaps nightmares at night. Uh, perhaps that, that they've noticed themselves avoiding reminders of that event. Uh, and perhaps they've noticed um, changes in the way that they they see themselves or, or the world or or the future. Um, and, and, and perhaps they've noticed that they're they're unusually kind of on edge or, or kind of wired, perhaps an enhanced startle response that those are an extremely common set of symptoms that are usually put understood as symptoms associated with a, a post-traumatic stress response and and if people are experiencing those symptoms then i'd you know i definitely recommend going to see a, a clinical psychologist or, or another health professional who can provide or offer an assessment um, and that's something that that i could help with if anyone watching would like to get in touch uh, about, I suppose, the other set of symptoms that are very common in patients with um, who are re re recovering from a, a period of cardiac ill ill health are changes in mood um, or, or depression. So, if somebody, for example, has, has noticed that it's been very difficult to find a sense of interest or pleasure in day to day activities. Um, and have have noticed that they're they're feeling unusually low or or hopeless. Um, 
And, and if those symptoms are occurring you know, more days than they're not over a period of, of say two weeks or so, then again, it's, you know, I'd recommend getting in touch with a healthcare professional who might be able to help with that, a GP or a, a clinical psychologist. Uh, so cardiac anxiety is a common problem, but it's not the only difficulty that, that people can experience in this area. Two things I wanted to ask you is, at what point does post-traumatic stress disorder, for example, become cardiac anxiety? Uh, and is there a difference in outcome? Is one easier to treat than the other? Uh, do you get better results with one over the other? Uh, the reason is, obviously, the different labels only are relevant if they result in different outcomes for the patient, right? So at what point would you say, okay, you don't have, you know, uh, some people grieve after they've lost a loved one for a year, for three years, you know, at what point do we say, okay, well, this is not related to that, but this is something which we would call as just cardiac anxiety. This is not any longer related to that thing that has happened to you which was a bad thing and is understandable but this is actually now something else so does there is it based on time uh, yeah. a cut off so sort of what's the difference between cardiac anxiety versus ptsd and what's and what would we do about yeah. it and how effective the treatments yeah. are yeah. yeah yeah thank you um so it in in terms of the difference it's important that we do differentiate between those two sets of symptoms because the treatment approach that we provide is is very different. Uh, I suppose the, one of the, the characteristics of post-traumatic stress is that people experience this sense of current threat. They start that this sense that something something bad is going to happen, an unusual sense of, of vulnerability. Um, and that, of course, is, is is very similar to what people with cardiac anxiety might experience, a sense that something else bad is going to happen, a sense of feeling unusually um, on edge or, or fearful regarding cardiac symptoms. Of course, the distinguishing factor is the presence of intrusive memories. So people with cardiac anxiety won't usually be experiencing flashbacks nightmares okay. memories relating to that traumatic life experience that come to mind against their will um but that's something that a psychologist can help to tease apart in terms of of effectiveness um actually psychological treatment programs for ptsd are pretty mo pretty much mo the most effective treatment of programs that we have uh, about 80 percent of people in the the randomized control trials experience clinically significant recoveries from ptsd following psychological treatment approaches um i think uh the the outcomes for cardiac anxiety are slightly lower than that but still very good in indeed um so you know very very common uh, difficulties that people experience um but we have very effective psychological treatment programs um, brief programs that that you know that typically are delivered over eight to twelve sessions. Um, yeah. Um, one another question I had is a lot of children these days uh, are uh, are being diagnosed with anxiety and anti anxiety and prescribed anti anxiolytics. And I tell you why this is interesting, because you've mentioned long COVID and POTS, uh, and I have over the last 10 years developed uh, a substantial you know, practice in managing patients with POTS and dysautonomia. And a lot of them come to me and they say, you know, I've been getting these symptoms since I was 15. Overnight, you know, my life changed. I've been getting those. And then for I got to see a cardiologist, they said I was okay. They left me alone. They said, go and see so-and-so. I went to a gastroenterologist. I've seen a neurologist. Ultimately, it's all been put down to anxiety. And I have anxiety. And I was 15 at the time. And and bang, anxiety on my lip. But I know what is anxiety. And I know that this isn't anxiety. And when I've listened to these people, I've realized that many of them say the same thing. So clearly, this is not a, uh, a singular, you know, this is not an experience by one person, but uh, uh, a very common thing. And so 
as I've looked into dysautonomias and POTS, I've realized that these are conditions which are conditions of adrenaline excess. So they these patients seem to have a biochemical overreaction of adrenaline, you know, the small rises in adrenaline, it's something that produces a small rise in adrenaline produces a huge rise in adrenaline in these people. So they're always kind of wired and tired. Um, and, and so obviously there is, uh, to a simple, you know, simpleton like me, I think of the way I describe anxiety to my patients is I say, well, anxiety is like a mental overreaction. You're taking something and it, it's it's making it bigger than it is, uh, uh, but some people actually seem to have a biochemical overreaction, right? So so actually, it's not their brain that is processing things in a different way, but actually, they're just producing too much adrenaline. They see a cat, but they produce the adrenaline associated with seeing a tiger, and mm. so they behave like they've seen a tiger. So everyone else looks at them and says, "You're anxious because we can see a cat," and they say, "Yeah, I can see a cat, but I don't know why I'm behaving like I've seen a tiger." Hmm. which is really interesting and you will start finding that these patients also end up with you not because because of a problem with the way medicine is practiced which is that different specialists will say oh i cannot look beyond my organ system so i cannot look at the patient as a whole so if it's not this and it's not this and it's not this well, then those cracks all mean you go into that anxiety kind of pit. Mm -hmm. And that's where you're going to be. So it's just worth me mentioning that because there may be some people out there saying, well, I've been told I have anxiety all this time because they've not found anything wrong with me. But maybe the medical profession that needs to be a little bit more um, introspective, a little bit more humble and start saying that actually, if the patient's complaining, we need to look beyond what we're already doing just in case, just in case there's something physical going on as well. You know, you address it. And in some ways you, I think that collaboration shouldn't end. It shouldn't be, oh, well, you've got nothing wrong with your heart, finish, go away. It should be an ongoing collaboration for the sake of the patient because we learn from each other, right? And that's a big problem that your feedback probably never gets to the cardiologist because the cardiologist has discharged the patient and they say, well, it's not our problem. Go away and see the psychologist. And they, the cardiologist, therefore, never learns from your insight. And so we never improve for the sake of the patient. We never improve. We never get that kind of... Um, you know, so that we can then do better for the next patient that comes uh, through the door. And that, I think, is an interesting thing. Yeah, I, I certainly recognise the um, the the way in which healthcare systems are set up in this country can sometimes exacerbate anxiety because of the way that different specialties operate uh, with separation in the way that you're describing. Many people who have been referred on to, to many, many different medical specialties and gone through all sorts of tests. And the tests have, have perhaps shown up, thrown up some uh, a, a certain finding that hasn't concerned the, the doctors at all, but has triggered you know, an exacerbation of, of health anxiety in, in the patient um, or, or even a false positive finding that has triggered an exacerbation of anxiety for the patient um, in, in a way that can be deeply unhelpful, unfortunately. We mentioned, um, you mentioned, uh, you know, um, some thinking traps that are associated with cardiac anxiety oh, yeah. and you talked about um, social isolation uh, that results. So could you talk us a little bit through the thinking traps that are uh, very common in uh, cardiac anxiety and also how you go about addressing the social isolation, which, I think results uh, in these patients. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Um, quite quite big questions, but I'll try and keep it um, keep it concise. I suppose. So just to say briefly about perhaps how we might understand cardiac anxiety within a, a CBT model. Um, so usually there's there's some sort of trigger for uh, an increase in cardiac anxiety. That trigger could be an external trigger something in the environment, perhaps going to a certain place or a certain context, being in a busy environment or further away from trusted healthcare or being in an isolated rural environment. Or the trigger could be internal, something that happens inside our bodies, an increase in heart rate, breathlessness, sweating, dizziness. 
one way or the other, those triggers lead to an increase in uh, uh, in anxiety and an, and a thought, an illness thought, a thought that that something is wrong or that something dangerous is happening. That illness thought then triggers anxiety, which in itself is often associated with all, with all sorts of physical uh, changes in our body, increase in heart rate, sweating, shaking, perhaps dizziness. And then what happens often in cardiac anxiety is that we we fall into the trap of misinterpreting those the meaning of those physical symptoms in a, a catastrophic or worst case scenario way but perhaps we believe that because I once you know because we're breathless and our heart is racing I'm having a heart attack I'm going to collapse I'm going to die so there's what the literature calls a catastrophic misinterpretation of what those symptoms mean so that's one of the common thinking traps, I suppose, that that what one can fall into, which which then maintains cardiac anxiety, a, a tendency to 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 interpret physical symptoms in a catastrophic or worst case scenario sort of way. Uh, but but interestingly, the literature suggests that that that's you know if if somebody is only experiencing a tendency to catastrophize. Yeah, usually people can can manage that. Um, what what is really hard if, is if that tendency to catastrophize is combined with a tendency to find uncertainty very difficult to tolerate. Uh, so we call this a an intolerance of uncertainty. M many many people experiencing cardiac anxiety. I think one of the biggest challenges that that people face is the is is relearning. The ability to tolerate uncertainty in relation to one's one's health, one, one's cardiac health. Um, yeah, well, the fact of life, I suppose, is that we're all going to die. We're all going to become seriously ill at some point. And the key to tolerating that that fact, that uncertainty about about when that will occur, is uh, sorry. What I meant to say is the the key to living one's best life in the meantime is tolerating that uncertainty um we don't know when it's going to be we don't know what's going to happen to us and if one becomes intolerant of that uncertainty and we combine that with a tendency to catastrophize regarding the meaning of symptoms that that's a really common set of thinking traps that characterize cardiac anxiety um a second set of thinking traps that are, are really common in cardiac anxiety often are, are called metacognitive beliefs about worry or in other words beliefs about what it means to to worry um so so for example uh positive beliefs about worry might be sort of essentially beliefs about you know that it's helpful to worry somehow that it protects us perhaps if i worry about these symptoms it will help me to deal with them or it help me to problem solve them. Um, worrying keeps me safe. These would be positive beliefs about worry, which then keep worry going. But unfortunately, an unwanted side effect of worry is that it, it takes us, you know, ch worries chain together and take us psychologically to an Im imagined, perhaps improbable, but very frightening future scenario. Conversely, we might experience negative beliefs about what it means to worry. We might think if I if I keep worrying about this, I'm going to give myself a heart attack or I'm going to you know, make myself seriously ill. So that would be an example of a negative belief about worry. And because worry is so you know, often quite uncontrollable or people experience it as quite uncontrollable, if they believe that worrying is going to lead to a heart attack and they can't stop themselves doing it, you can imagine how that would maintain cardiac anxiety when when actually the the relationship between worry and stress and cardiac ill health it's you know, so much more complex than that and there's there's absolutely no evidence to suggest that people um you know that worry um causes ca cardiac ill health uh, so yeah so those are some of the, the common thinking traps that characterize cardiac anxiety it's interesting, isn't it? I always say to my patients that, you know, worry doesn't stop you dying. Worry stops you living. Mm. 
Um, and, and uh, you know, a lot of people will hear that and nod and say, that's very true. And, and my rational brain tells me that that is true. But at the time when I'm having these symptoms, they feel so real, it's impossible. It's beyond me at that time. Um, so um, obviously one of the, uh, because again, the problem with the healthcare system now is that uh, doctors don't have time and doctors don't place enough importance on the things that they don't think are important. Uh, even though the patient may think they're important, uh, a lot of times patients go and they just get put given a medication like an anti-anxiolytic or you here's some Prozac or here's some fluoxetine or here are some, you know, I, I used to work for a surgeon so who'd say every patient, you know, they've had life threatening surgery uh, and they'll say, oh, just give them some happy pills, you know, hmm. happy pills and out. And, uh, and I'm not sure whether that sorts the problem out, you know, that perhaps doesn't, get to the core of the problem that is uh, uh, an easy means to show the patient the door so that you could see someone else uh, do you do you feel that um, that there is an un an, that that we are over reliant that there's an over reliance on on just giving people tablets uh, do, do you think that uh, we should be doing the thing we should be doing things and addressing the root cause of the problem rather than just this kind of current practice where almost everyone is on an anti anxiolytic uh, even kids you know uh, does that uh, help or hinder the problem yeah so I, I mean i'll just caveat my answer here a little bit by just emphasizing that as a clinical psychologist i'm psychologically trained and, and not medically trained so certainly can't provide any advice around medications as a treatment option. My understanding though of the, of the literature is that for, for the, the more severe end of, of cardiac of patient of cardiac anxiety, for patients experiencing more severe forms of cardiac anxiety, psychological treatment approaches and medication can can be helpful and can help people to achieve um optimal outcomes i think unfortunately because of the 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 limited availability of psychological treatment programs um and the fact that in the short term medications are sometimes cheaper to prescribe um than say 12 sessions of cbt then it might be the case that people are more readily offered medication than, than they are than they are CBT and, and that's a problem um because we know first of all in the longer term psychological treatment programs are more cost effective uh because usually medications have to go on for longer and when people stop the medication if they've not completed a psychological treatment program there's a much higher risk of relapse or, or kind of going backwards there's a cardiac anxiety um and yeah, I can't remember. My mind is gone. I can't remember where I was going with the rest of that answer. But you I just... were talking about uh, the the fact that um, that uh, there's a problem if doctors uh, don't combine medications as a short term treatment with a more longer term treatment plan through psychological interventions. Yeah, thank you. That was it. I, I suppose point that I wanted to emphasize is from the literature we don't have a, a clear guide on whether psychological treatment programs or medications are more more effective um, but certainly psychological treatment or programs are offered as first line um, and secondly what's really important is patient choice um, so patients are given um, the the information uh, that they need to make an informed decision about the, the different treatment options available but in an ideal world i mean my my understanding is that obviously you want to make that person a healthier person that's what our aim should be you know and and actually whilst medications can be helpful as a short-term approach uh, and perhaps long-term in those people where uh, they really struggle uh, these aren't i i'm not sure whether they change the outcome i don't Think they change the underlying process that's going on i think they they make things bearable uh at the cost of costs side effects uh 
you know, the risk of polypharmacy, etc. So, uh, so it's a shame that, uh, you know, I would have thought that every patient where you are suspecting this should be evaluated by a psychologist as well. Uh, and that treatment plan is best made in collaboration, as we've already mentioned, rather than, mm -hmm. rather than, you know, uh, they're not mutually exclusive is what I'm trying to get at. So they, 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 they should all form little um, uh, bits of the patient's whole treatment plan. Yes. Um, Ag agreed. Yeah, there are certainly much lower rates of relapse, you know, relapse from psychological treatment programs than there are for medication. My recommendation to people I meet is, is absolutely um, to, to trial a, a psychological treatment program first and a cardiac specialist psychological treatment program. Yeah. Sometimes people have had suboptimal experiences of CBT where it's perhaps been delivered in a generic way um, without specificity to the, 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 the cardiac context, perhaps by a practitioner who doesn't really understand the cardiac symptoms that people are experiencing. So I suppose what I'd like to say to people watching is if you've had a suboptimal experience of CBT to date, I really encourage you not to write the model off too early because it, it can be transformative. Is CBT uh, the main model you use in your patients? Yeah, um, it is cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT. These days, it's an, an umbrella term for a whole range of different psychological models and theories. Um, CBT essentially understands that psychological health difficulties can, can arise from the way in which thoughts, behaviors, emotions, physical sensations interact with each other in a, a particular context. And of course, context can, can include what's happening in the here and now, but also one's learning history and, and experiences in the past. Um, so yeah, CBT is, is the, 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 the best evidence model that we have for addressing anxiety generally and, and cardiac anxiety more specifically. So for example, um, you know, let's say I have cardiac anxiety, I want um, help with that. Over what course, what kind of treatment course would someone like me, um, I mean, I know everyone is an individual and you have to tailor treatment to that individual, but in average, in your experience, how long a treatment, uh, should a treatment regime be hmm. with someone like yourself? Uh, and what kind of outcomes do you see? How do you measure your outcomes? How do you know that uh, uh, that this has actually resulted in a meaningful impact mm. on that patient in terms of quality of life? How do you measure that? And uh, and after how long do you expect to see a change in that measure? Yeah, thank you. So, um, uh, so. It, that your question, Sanjay, was about treatment length, what exactly it involves and what how how we measure yeah. effectiveness. In your experience and, yeah. and what kind of results have you had where do you find that there are people uh they get 10% better? Do you think that uh with the you know the, in the best case scenarios, people can just go back to living a completely normal life? Do they do you think that they uh still come back to you after a few months do you actually get rid of the problem do you get it a little bit better do you get it uh, uh much better that's the kind of thing i'm sort of interested in knowing about yeah so so what would what happens first typically is that i, I meet people for a, a call just to understand their symptoms in a bit more detail and to, to check out their goals for further sessions and to make sure that there's a good fit essentially between their goals and my areas of competence and, and experience. Um, from there, we then perhaps meet for an assessment. Um, that assessment then allows for the development of what's called a, a formulation, which is essentially a, a, a model that's that's grounded in theory, but tailored according to the the very specific um, symptoms and, and clinical needs of, of that patient. And then that formulation guides what we do over, over subsequent sessions. Um, I would say that typically I meet people for uh, to address cardiac anxiety over eight to 12 sessions, I would say is the, 
the average and the range is probably anything from say six up to 16 sessions something like that those sessions are typically delivered uh, weekly but perhaps in the latter stages of our meetings we might start to meet fortnightly or every three weeks just to give people more time to to work on the between session work um that's a really important point to emphasize actually really that cbt is it's it's not really a talking therapy anywhere near as much as it is a doing therapy you know some some speaking some discussion is of course involved but really the the change in cbt arises from the experiment the, the doing the experimentation trialing new strategies the between session work so it's a much it's a really active approach um and and as i say a doing therapy much more than it is a a, a, a talking therapy um we measure our outcomes using different measures according to the the problem that we're we're working with with patients on but in cardiac anxiety there's a, a measure called the cardiac anxiety questionnaire um that allows us to sort of objectively measure symptoms um, and that provides patients with sort of real-time feedback on on their their progress in terms of effectiveness uh, i would say that the vast majority of patients notice a, a very very significant improvement in their quality of life um I recently put together an online program actually uh, an online video based program and in the pilot um nine out of 11 patients reported ex at least a 50 percent reduction in their cardiac anxiety and, and just to bring that to life a, a bit one one guy emailed me recently to say that he was back to playing football for the first time in 11 years another um patient was in touch recently to say that she's back to driving uh which allows her to uh go and care for her grandkids in a way that she wasn't able to to do uh previously um so it's a very effective psychological treatment approach so it's, it's sometimes a work in progress by the end of a series of sessions um but but people you know have the, the skills and, and know what to do to continue with the, the work that they've started in a, across a series of sessions. Presumably um, some of their physical symptoms get better along with the, 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 the symptoms of the anxiety, but the actual physical symptoms that probably result, led them to seek help in the first place also get better as their cardiac anxiety gets better. Have you noticed that? Yeah, I, I have um but very often actually people's physical symptoms improve it's it's always something that i'm clear with patients on that we we can't we shouldn't consider a sort of primary outcome um mm -hmm. because of course while patients want that to occur i you know certainly wouldn't guarantee it because of course things like ectopics or palpitations or chest pain they they're, they're complex and they depend on lots of variables beyond purely the, the psychological variables so i'd usually suggest and recommend to patients that we consider quality of life the primary sort of outcome that we're aiming for or, or that you know the patient's goals within that caring for the grandkids or getting back to playing football etc but but very often an improvement in the physical symptoms themselves is a, a secondary outcome uh, another question I had is, so, you know, so you represent something which is very much uh, an unmet need, you know, um, out there, uh, as you've said, that it's very difficult for patients to access people like yourself, um, because, you know, you go to a GP. I mean, in some ways, it's terrible if you think about it. Let's say I start getting chest discomfort tonight, and then... Um, I go, I have to go and see my GP that could take two weeks, you know, and then whilst I'm waiting for that, all I come across is sort of horror stories, how chest pain can be dangerous. After two weeks, I then get sent to a specialist uh, six months later, who then spends five minutes with me and says, oh, it's fine, go away. Uh, things are building up in the background, you know, the, that the, the, the kind of stress and the, the, the turmoil that the poor patient has to go through 
to get to that stage is so huge. And then it's so much of a letdown when someone only has five or 10 minutes to get to you. And more often than not, the doctor will not say then, okay, here's the next step. They'll say, okay, nothing for me to do here. You can go home. So to try and just be able to access you is so incredibly difficult given the current systems, you know, unless someone really has the time, uh, knows about you, has a mechanism, and then there's this whole funding issue and protocol and guidelines and all this kind of stuff. And I'm very much now of the belief that what you want to do is find people and make them accessible to the general public and cut all these middlemen out, cut the GP out, cut the, uh, you know, cut all these other people out and make people like you just visible to the world to say, okay, here is someone that you can just go talk without any preconceived notions, you know, and 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 get an opinion from someone who can give you a different insight compared to your GP or your cardiologist. So how do patients access you? That's the question. I mean, my it's all very well sort of saying that you exist, but then I have to, I would be uh, doing my patients, the viewers, a disservice if I couldn't tell them how they could access you. I mean, the, the first route would be via the more than just medicine uh, website. Um, as as you know, you, you know, Sanjay, that, so this is a, a sort of collaboration between uh, different healthcare professionals, and I'm, I'm sure you'll say more about it shortly. Um, but but essentially, it reflects the the enormous benefits that we see from psychologists, um, cardiologists, and other healthcare professionals working alongside each other in order to achieve optimal outcomes for patients and and to collaborate around patients patients health care so that would be the first route through the more than just medicine website um if people watching would like to read any more about my professional background or experience there's also uh, my own website um which is uh www.rethinkhealth-online.com um, and in fact, on that website is a link to the Living Well with Cardiac Symptoms program. Um, I mentioned earlier today how one of the, the problems that the, the literature defines is that cardiac anxiety is such a, is such a common problem. There's, it's so prevalent, uh, and yet there is such limited access to high quality psychological treatment programs. But it you know, it doesn't have to be like this uh, because many people that I meet don't necessarily need or want to work with a psychologist on a one-to-one -one basis and might instead benefit from accessing uh, an online program. Uh, so I, I put together an eight-session uh, video-based program. Uh, it's called the Living Well with Cardiac Symptoms program. The, the aim is essentially to help people getting back to living their best lives following a period of cardiac illness or or experiencing cardiac symptoms. Uh, it's done, designed to be a, a, a specialist, uh, customizable, uh, instantly accessible and, and cost effective way of accessing uh, an evidence based treatment for, for cardiac anxiety. It's is based on a, a proven model um, and it, it's new uh, and, and designed to be as accessible as possible so i really invite people that are watching who are interested to go and check out a freely accessible 15 minute introductory video that is on my website uh, under the living well with cardiac symptoms tab uh, that provides that 15 minute video aims to provide people with more information about the program so they can make an informed decision about whether they uh, wish to, to go ahead and, and access it or not uh, and in fact, I'll, I'll just mention briefly that if anyone watching would be interested in accessing the program, uh, there's a discount code set up. Uh, the discount code is York Cardiology, uh, which will uh, allow a £20 discount from the, the cost of the program. Uh, do go and check it out if it's of interest.
Wonderful. So, so in essence, there are lots and lots of ways by which people can contact you. Um, the More Than Just Medicine uh, website that you mentioned, mtjm.co.uk, that is a collaboration where we decided that we needed more joined up thinking, we needed more holistic care, and we needed to get the middlemen out. You know, we wanted to be accessible to the patient. The patient can then come. And, and the more important thing is that the professionals on there talk to each other. Uh, it's not that you are going and so so in some ways they come from the same mindset, which is very patient centered, very holistic care. So you have uh, someone with psychological expertise, such as yourself, someone who has a cardiac background like myself, uh, a physiotherapist, a lady with women's uh, interest in women's health. And my hope is that as time progresses, we get more professionals. You know, a lot of the times the mentality has become my medicine is good, your medicine is bad. And actually, it shouldn't be about that. It shouldn't be about me or you. It should be, let's join forces for the benefit of that patient. Let's all work towards the benefit of the patient because there is a combined, um, there's great strength in joining forces for the sake. And that's when you start making the patient feel secure because they think, okay, all these people coming from different angles with one um, object in mind, and that is to improve my, my health, my state of health. Um, so more than just medicine is on uh, mtjm.co.uk. You're kindly on there. You've also kindly agreed to talk to uh, anyone who goes to contact you through MTJM for an introductory chat. Anyone who wants to explore whether what you offer is a right fit for them, uh, you've kindly agreed that you would talk to them uh, for a few, you know, uh, 10, 15 minutes beforehand uh, yes, to see. Before they, yeah. Thank you. Before before they spend any money, etc., and then uh, for those people who um, cannot uh, invest the time or the money in one-on-one -on -one sessions, but still want to explore this further, you've done something amazing, which is set up this um, program, which uh, is on your website, uh, the Living Well. Uh, well, with cardiac uh, symptoms, yeah. Living Well with Cardiac Symptoms program on the Rethink on Health Online. Uh, website. Uh, and you've also very kindly offered uh, your cardiology uh, code holders a discount, which I think is amazing because at least I would encourage people to at least check these things out. You know, it's only through trial that we will know what else is out there. Um, I tell you, I tell you an interesting story. I mean, I, I've been an allopath all my life. I work in a hospital and uh, about three four or five years ago, I developed bilateral frozen shoulder. And honestly, if you have not had frozen shoulder, it is horrendous. It is incredibly painful. And both shoulders together is incredibly distressing. And I, being a doctor in the hospital, I thought that, um, you know, I would go and get care and I, I was referred to physiotherapy and I would see the physiotherapist once every three months. You know, and when I would see the physiotherapist, they wouldn't even lay their hands on me. They would just say, oh, we do this, do that. But here I was screaming in pain, you know, every time I'd have to extend my hand. And then I went and saw an acupuncturist. And before before all this, I was like, OK, this is my profession. This is what I deal with. This is what I have confidence in. But it was sheer, sheer out of sheer desperation that I thought, oh, I'll explore something like else. And I went and saw an acupuncturist. And gosh, the difference they made to me. Uh, was far greater than uh, the pills that I was being given and the physiotherapy exercises that I was given once every three months. So there's a lot to be said for people, uh, uh, for to for empowering people to try stuff out, try different things out. You know, everyone is in there. People have gotten into these professions for, because they wanted to help. So there is actually no harm in seeking out that help and seeing what that looks like and whether that works for you or not. Yeah, 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 well, ab absolutely. And um, yeah, we, as I say, I'm a big, what's something that is very, very important to me is is getting psychological theory out there, getting these models out there, because we, we have things that, we have these models and these treatment approaches that work. Um, the problem is that there's, there's still, unfortunately, such limited access world, worldwide. Um, so the Living Well with Cardiac Symptoms program is, is one attempt to start to address that. Because the this current status quo doesn't work. Otherwise, there wouldn't be this unmet need. 
you yeah. know, and, and that's why it's so important. So I am so grateful. I'm I'm so grateful that I've met you. I'm grateful for your wonderful expertise. I'm grateful for all the help that you've given me uh, in terms of managing uh, patients, many of whom have come back and found your interventions to be exceptionally helpful. I know a few of my patients have even joined the program, the online program, and they've seemed to have benefited from it greatly as well. So I hope we continue to collaborate once again. Thank you so much for the time that you've devoted uh, to this this morning. Um, I think it'd be lovely to do more together, more collaborative work and putting it out there for people who can watch it on social media, etc. Um, so uh, once again, thank you so much. And uh, please come and join us again. And I'd be pleased to. And if anyone has any specific questions that they'd like us to, to talk to next time, you know, please don't hesitate to, to let us know. And thank you for inviting me today, Sandra. It's been a pleasure. And uh, yeah, thanks again. Lovely. Thank you. Take care, Matthew. You too.